Darwin's travels inspired him to ask what might be the mechanism for evolutionary change. In 1857, Darwin wrote, it is wonderful what the principle of selection by man, that is the picking out of individuals with any desired quality and breeding from them and again picking out can do. Even breeders have been astonished at their own results. So every time you have a litter of offspring and there's one you really like, that's the pick of the litter, and you use that to establish the next generation, you're likely to see some change. This is called artificial selection. And we know that humans have been playing around with the phys physical shape of domestic animals for a very long period of time. So there's a variety of different domestic pigeons, for example, some of which have these absurd puffy chests. They look like those little badminton things that are just ridiculous. Some have kind of snowshoe feathers on their feet. Some look like they've swallowed a golf ball. Some look like I don't know what. And all of these descend from a common ancestor. And it's known that people who preferred snowshoes on the feet of their pigeons were always taking the pick of the litter. And eventually that trait got exaggerated. So there were variants within the species, and they just picked them out, picked them out, until they got more and more exaggerated. And this is what's led to the diversification of domestic dogs. All domestic dogs share a common ancestor, which was very much like a wolf. And you get yet these tiny little purse dogs here versus this huge Great, Great Dane type dog. So Darwin then reckoned that this principle of artificial selection could have been operating for a long time before people even consciously tried to produce these crazy forms. So he said there must have been also a kind of unconscious selection from the most ancient times, namely in the preservation of the individual animals without any thought of their offspring, most useful to each race of man in his particular circumstances. So this would have been important during the domestication of livestock initially and the origins of agriculture. So what he's saying is that even in the initial stages of domestication of our domestic livestock and crops, people were choosing certain traits, and they may not even have been aware of what they were doing. All of these different food plants, from cauliflower, kohlrabi, cabbage, etc., they're all descended from Brassica oleracea. They're all the same biological species. And the wild mustard from which they derive looks like this, a spindly little plant with a few wide leaves. So somewhere, some individuals may have preferred to save the seeds with bigger flowers and eventually ended up with cauliflower and broccoli. Others may have focused on the leaves and ended up with cabbage. So this all happened since the time of Aristotle, just in the last couple of thousand years. This much of morphological or physical change has been apparent by artificial selection on crops. This is also going on in the New World. So Native Americans started out with a grass called teosinte that they domesticated about 9,000 years ago. And by constantly saving the seeds that were larger, eventually we get domestic corn. So this has been going on. We know that you can get very different physical types descended from smaller ancestors by selecting out the variants that we prefer. Now, another thing that was incredibly important for Darwin in his thinking after he came back from his trip on the Beagle was the writings of Thomas Malthus. Malthus wrote this rather clumsily titled pamphlet called An Essay on the Principle of Population. An Essay on the Principle of Population is it affects the future improvements of society with remarks and speculations of several people. This was published in 1798. And Malthus wrote that it is an obvious truth that population must always be kept down to the level of the means of subsistence. And what he's saying is that any living thing can continue to, to produce seeds, babies, eggs, whatever, but they're not all going to survive. That there's a certain limit to how many living things can occupy a certain area because of limits on the means of subsistence. So Darwin, in 1838, he's just back from the Beagle, and he says, I happen to read Malthus on population, and being well prepared to appreciate the struggle for existence, it at once struck me that under these circumstances, favorable variations would tend to be preserved and unfavorable ones to be destroyed. 
The results of this would be the formation of a new species. Here then, I had at last got a theory by which to work. What he's saying is that, well, with artificial selection, that could be done deliberately to get new forms. But in nature, there's many more individuals being produced than can possibly survive. In his own travels, he would have seen animals that were eaten by predators, starving to death. Not everyone is going to survive. Only those that possessed the favorable variation would be the ones to leave descendants in the next generation. So now, taking his direct observations from his travels, the idea of Malthus on favorable variants surviving and unfavorable variants disappearing, he can look at the diversity of life. And he would say, look at all these different kinds of beetles, which likely shared a common ancestry. He then became familiar with Lyle's ideas, and he brought them to biology. And he wrote that species, like geological features, evolved gradually. Like the shifting and rising and falling of land, the forces of reproduction, inheritance, and competition gradually produced the diversity of life on Earth. About the same time that Darwin was coming up with all this, there was another biologist, likewise traveling around tropical areas, named Alfred Russell Wallace, who lived from 1823 to 1913. He was a schoolmaster and a self-taught naturalist. He accompanied a group who went to the Amazon. He did the natural history of the Amazon between 1848 and 1852. So like Darwin, a long time in the tropics. He then traveled to Malaysia in 1854. Like Darwin, he read Lyell. He read Malthus. And then in 1855, he famously wrote, every species has come into existence, coincident both in space and time with a pre-existing closely allied species. So that same insight that Darwin had, thinking about Darwin's finches, the armadillos, and all those sorts of things, new species come in coincident in space and time with a pre-existing closely allied species. And he then wrote to Darwin, one of the most famous letters in the history of science, in February of 1858. He wrote, the life of wild animals is a struggle for existence. The full exertion of all their faculties and all their energies is required to preserve their own existence and provide for that of their infant offspring. The possibility of procuring food during the least favorable seasons and of escaping the attacks of their most dangerous enemies are the primary conditions which determine the existence both of individuals and of entire species. He's got the same general idea. You're going to have some individuals surviving and some not. And those with the favorable variant are going to leave them more offspring. So now we have Darwin and Wallace coming up with a very similar notion of what causes evolution to take place. Darwin, up to this point, had been very slowly working on a massive book that he titled Natural Selection. But he was so cautious that it wasn't yet ready. After receiving Wallace's letter, Darwin and Wallace published jointly in the 1st of July, 1858, including an essay that Darwin had written already in 1844, where he outlined most of these principles, but not yet published. Then, in 1859, Darwin published, finally, his incredibly important book, The Origin of Species. And the subtitle of that was By Means of Natural Selection.